Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And we're working on a series right now called The Cults. And we just uh, finished three episodes discussing Mormonism, and today we're going to begin discussing uh, Jehovah Witnesses. So uh, if you didn't see the other episodes, they're available on my channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, first, let me uh, uh, introduce the, the panelists here. We'll start with uh, Brother Joe. You want to introduce yourself and say hi? Yeah, uh, I'm Jay Byron. Uh, my channel is Jay Byron, uh, coincidentally. Uh, just uh, in looking forward to the uh, teaching and, and learning and uh, got a renewed appreciation of our fellowship. So uh, it's a good night. Okay. All right. Thank you for joining us, Joe. And next is Brother Eric. Hi, I'm Eric. Uh, my YouTube channel is Jesus Knight 72 uh, Looking forward to hopefully you know, uh, letting the Holy Spirit uh, help us to open some eyes out there tonight. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, does, is Jackson still there? Is he? Uh, I'm here. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was your screen was black. Okay, brother Jackson. Okay. Um, my name is Jackson. My YouTube channel is Mecha Wing Zero. I'm an analyzer, and I've said before I'm not a teacher. I'm a student, and I like to analyze things. And I've recently started making videos, and I have Asperger's syndrome, and Hello to everyone out there. Okay. Thank you, Brother Jackson uh, and Brother Mitch. Hello, I'm Brother Mitch, black sheep of Christianity. <laughs> Not actually, but I do have Asperger's Syndrome. Uh, Mitch Bellenkopf is my channel. Uh, you can probably find it at, at Sin City Preacher's channel, and uh, it, it's good to be here. Uh, yeah, well, let me say that... Uh, uh, I've been doing this uh, show now for several months. I think I have about 25 or so uh, episodes up. Each episode's two hours long. And during that time, I've had probably a total of maybe uh, 10 or 15 uh, people participating as panelists. And I think now I've got a group of people on the panel who've been able to come on a regular basis who are really what I had in mind when I started this. And that is... Um, people who uh, not only have uh, enough knowledge that they can contribute to the conversation, but also the kind of personality where they're not all shy and, and, and you know, withdrawn. And, you know, they are w willing to talk. So now my, my problem is getting a word in edgewise. <laughs> but it's been my intention all along to not have this uh, show, uh, uh, This is Brother Luke Teaching. No, uh, it, this is a discussion group, and I'm, I'm really happy now that uh, there's so much participation that every, everybody's uh, getting their, their three cents worth in. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start off by just looking at the doctrines uh, from the Jehovah Witnesses, and then uh, uh, we'll discuss it and see if they, their, their doctrine agrees with uh, what the Bible says. Um, Okay, it says, uh, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, uh, its followers known as Jehovah's Witnesses, claim to be the only true Christians on earth today. They also claim to have exclusive understanding of the Bible. According to the Watchtower, Jehovah's Witnesses are the only ones who serve the true God, uh, whom they say is Jehovah, and everyone else serves Satan. Because of these claims, uh, we as Christians uh, have taken the Bible, which we believe is the inspired word of God, and use it to expose the false doctrines of Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, so I'd like everybody to give just their, before we even discuss any of their actual doctrines, just give your, your first impression of what you think of Jehovah's Witnesses from what you understand now. And let's start with, uh, since you're, you're lined up like this. I'm just going to go from my left to right. It would be Brother Joe. Okay. Uh, I, I didn't have a chance to do uh, any research on, on JWs. Uh, my knowledge uh, of them uh, is pretty limited. I, I know that they have a reputation for evangelism, and uh, a lot of people like to make fun of them for knocking on doors and uh, 
I find them quite to be quite irritating. Uh, don't know a lot about their doctrine though, except uh, that they don't accept Christ uh, as the, the Son of God uh, who died for our sins. Okay. Uh, yeah. One thing about the, the discussions uh, we're having in these cults is you don't really have to know a lot about the doctrines of the groups because uh, I've got the research uh, so I can tell you what the doctrines are and then I just need you to react to it. And uh, I think we all know enough about the, the, the scriptures, the, the Bible, to that we can see if, if the Jehovah Witness uh, doctrines agree with the Bible or not. Okay, uh, Brother Eric, what's your first impression of, of uh, Jehovah Witnesses from what you understand now? Well, I've actually had the opportunity to work with a couple of friends of mine who were Jehovah's Witnesses, and um, you know, much like Mormons, um, they have they have a lot of commonalities. They, uh, you know, they're very nice people. They're um, they're they respectable people. Um, more than other Christians who actually have more foundational truth, they're much more dedicated. They actually spend more time going out there and trying to actually spread what they believe is the word, even though it may be an error. Um, but for the most part, you know, they they're very um, they're very much into uh, end times uh, study, um, not in the correct way, um, albeit. But as I said, you know, for the most part, as people, they're very nice, respectable people. They they seem very caring, and uh, you can get along with them. Mm -hmm. oh, they're very religious people, aren't they? Yes, yes, they are. Uh, they're, they're they're you're going to see a lot of commonalities, I think, to. Um, how how their organization goes uh, from a lot like uh, Mormonism and other religions that we talked about as far as stretching the it goes from Christ being the foundation and being the way to the organization being the way. So it's and we've talked about that before. I was a little quick on the button. I thought when you paused you would stop, but you, it was just a little pause. <laughs> okay. uh, Brother Jackson. Well, it's interesting because Brother Eric and I usually agree a hundred percent is what I've noticed and this is interesting it's a very very minor point but interestingly this is probably the first time I really disagree with brother Eric and that's I don't see a lot of commonalities between them and Mormons at all I've known quite a few Mormons and stuff and they seem like they're people who love to have fun and love to do stuff as a family and love to do all this I view Jehovah's Witnesses as being like hardcore soldiers is basically the way I have it. Let's put it this way. In college here, I've met, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a student at Colorado State. Maybe I should have said that in my, um, in my uh, introduction. But anyway, here at Colorado State University, being a secular school, there are people from all kinds of different religious backgrounds and all kinds of different beliefs. And I've met a few Mormons here. I've met a, not not a few Mormons, but here's the I, there's the thing. I have never once met a Jehovah's Witness on this campus. I've never heard of a Jehovah's Witness being on this campus. That doesn't mean there isn't one. I'm sure there is somewhere. But the point being, I don't think a lot of them go to college because I see them as just being so locked into what they're doing, kind of like being in a military sort of in a military that doesn't fight. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a it's an accurate uh, point, uh, but I want to f follow up a question there. Why is it you don't see them in college? Is anybody aware of that? The only thing I can imagine. I mean, I don't I don't know for an absolute fact. I don't know if it's forbidden or something, but I do know that because they spend so much time, it'd be hard to have time to do college because college is a, a time-consuming, time-eating thing here. And if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you're having to obey the elders and everything. And it, from what I know about their lifestyle, it's a pretty, uh, it's pretty regimented. Probably be hard to squeeze schoolwork in here and there. Okay, uh, let me just say that the the main reason they don't go to college is because they they're taught that it's a waste of time because the end is so near. There's no reason to go pursue higher education and develop your careers because the end, the end times are here right now. So you don't need to worry about that. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Austin. And now, since we have a disagreement between Eric and Austin and Jackson. Jackson, Jackson, we're going to have to uh, decide who can stay on the panel because we can't put up with any disagreements here. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know what? You know what? I'll I'll volunteer. I'll take myself out. out. I, I think I think Eric's a heretic. <laughs> <laughs> so now now we're, we can never speak again. We have to make videos against each other, right? Uh, that, that, that that might be one of the nicer things that I've been called, actually. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, that's just an inside joke. If you haven't followed some of our drama lately, but. Uh, the, the 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 criteria to be on the panel really is that we have to agree on our basic core beliefs. Uh, Jesus is God. Salvation comes through faith alone and Christ alone, and we can never lose our salvation for any reason. Now, all the other things like this dispute we're having over defining Jehovah Witnesses, anything else is we a lot we tolerate other opinions. And if someone cannot tolerate other opinions, uh, then they should not be in our panel because uh, uh, we want to hear other opinions. That's how we learn by discussing them and being still remaining, uh, you know, friends and gentle. Uh, so that was just a joke. Uh, now we're going to ask Brother Mitch if he has any uh, first impressions of Jehovah Witnesses he wants to tell us. Well, if everybody's thinking like everybody else, then somebody isn't thinking. I <laughs> Yeah, that's true. The major thing uh, that happens there out of fear and out of uh, peer pressure, you're not allowed. You're really in this, you must think this way, mind control. And every religion like this, and it's a shame that it's done in Christ's name or in God's name because it takes Christianity and, and maligns Christ and takes our freedom away to think. You know, yes, we we are we were given a mind to think. We were given freedom freedom in Christ, but when when I when I restrict everything to my point of view and I tell you you must think that way, uh, this is not just reminiscent of, of of Jehovah Witnesses, but this is this is the the the, the plight of mankind and, and religiosity itself, is that people are not allowed to have their own mind and think for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, there are. Uh... We've talked lately about the problem of dogmatism, and you talk about dogmatists. Jehovah Witnesses uh, could be the best example of the most extreme dogmatism, so much that that uh, they basically are like zombies or robots that are programmed to think and uh, behave in a certain way. Uh, so we'll discuss that in more detail later. Okay, so thank you, Brother Mitch. Okay, uh, I'm going to go last, give you my my first impression of Jehovah Witnesses and I, I'm afraid that uh, uh, I'm going to make an announcement today and this is probably going to shock you but you know I I've, I've say a lot of controversial things so maybe, maybe it won't shock you but um, uh, I, I have to confess to everybody right now that the truth is I am a Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. Me too! Yeah, you are too, Mitch. Yes, yes. You didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Me three. <laughs> do you do you guys know Michael Jackson? <laughs> uh, I, of course, we we've had Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses come to our doors, and uh, I'm also a Latter Day Saint, by the way. <laughs> yes, I know. I like that. When you said that uh, in the closing statements of the last show, I thought that was a beautiful thought. And it also made me remember that I needed to apply it to the Jehovah Witnesses. So Jackson, I'm just I'm just rolling with what you gave me, you know. Uh, but kind of like uh, the legalism thing. But I've had um, I've had Jehovah Witnesses come to the door, and I like to tell them. I say, look, uh, you're not a Jehovah's Witness. I'm a Jehovah's Witness. And they say, what? You're a Jehovah's Witness, and I said, "Yeah, but I'm not an apostate Jehovah's Witness like you guys. You and your organization are apost apostate Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm a true Jehovah's Witness." You know, <laughs> it takes a while to understand what I'm trying to tell them that is that we we Christians truly are the witnesses, the true witnesses for Jehovah God, mm -hmm. who is Jesus Christ, who is Jehovah God Almighty. Absolutely. So. So uh, they're really pretenders when they say they're Jehovah's Witnesses because Jehovah is just kind of a, they pasted it together to come up with a, a way of pronouncing the name of God. Mm -hmm. And so they, uh, maybe Mitch can talk more about this since he's into this Jewish semantics more, much more than me, but, but uh, Jehovah is the name for God Almighty. 
in, in, the, in the scriptures, and we know that Jesus Christ is God Almighty. So when we are ambassadors witnessing for Jesus, we are Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay? Now, I think I deserve a round of applause. Okay, and so, uh, Mitch, do <laughs> Mitch, do you have anything more to say about the word, though? Uh, because I thought you might have some thoughts on that. Well, nobody, nobody actually, uh, you know, it, 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 nobody really knows how to pronounce it, as far as I know, because it, because the ancient word has been lost and they didn't, they wouldn't use it uh, that often. Um, but the Yahweh is, is is the way many people pronounce that. But the the main thing that that, that 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 I think about is Yeshua, which is which is God saves. Um, that's that's more, you know, if we're going to witness something, they they seem to, to to put the lesser on Yeshua and the more on Jehovah. And the thing is, is that the real witness that we're supposed to be witnessing is Yeshua, God saves. What they're witnessing is is that God is holy and we need to save ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, what they have in common basically with all the religions and, and much of the of what we call Christendom. Uh, Christendom is a, a broad umbrella that uh, everybody falls under who is labeled as a Christian. All the different denominations and sects that people consider to be Christian, that's Christendom. And under that umbrella, uh, you have the vast majority of them who are, are not really believing in the, the real Jesus or and the real uh, means of salvation. So I think in all of Christendom, we probably have a very small percentage that I would really call what I call Christians, people who are relying completely on Christ for their salvation. So um, uh, these... Uh, well, I forgot why I was why I even said that, but I hope it helps somebody <laughs> for whatever reason I said it. Okay, uh, let's go to um, the uh, this point here. It says the Watchtower has established a certain uh, certain requirements for baptism, which its followers are expected to carry out. One, each must gain accurate doctrinal knowledge through a systematic study of the Watchtower publications. Each must pass an exam conducted by the elders over on over 80 questions concerning the doctrines of Jehovah's Witnesses before permission is granted for baptism. Each must, in effect, declare any other prior baptism invalid. All right, so bef before I cite any scriptures on this, uh, just uh, anybody's first reaction to that, and now I'm going to just ask everybody to go, whoever speaks first. My first reaction is, what, are they teaching baptismal regeneration? No. But it, it is a requirement, but it's not baptismal regeneration. Okay. Do, do they consider the Watchtower publication to be uh, on par with the uh, Gospels? And do they use the Bible uh, as, their, uh, as a uh, sacred book? Well, uh, we're going to go into that question later in more detail, but I'll answer it briefly now. Uh, they consider the truth to come from their publications uh, rather than the Bible. And, and the Bible that they use is one that they translated uh, so that they try to translate it in a way that it conforms to their false doctrines. So anytime it refers to Jesus as being God or, or that you're saved by faith alone, they tr try to change those verses in their translation. It's called the New World Translation. That's the Bible that they it, it sounds a lot like the Ronco Erasable Bible, where you can just take out those nasty parts and rewrite them. <laughs> but the Bible is Bible is not really their source of truth. It's like similar to uh, to Mormons. Uh, even though they they have a Bible, they go to the source of truth as their leaders of the church. The president of the church is speaking for God, like the Pope does in the Roman Catholicism. And, and then they, the writings that they use are the writings from the church, the Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Praise, Doctrines of Covenant, Covenants, jur Journals and Discourses. Well, it's also the same true with Jehovah Witnesses in that their source for truth are these publications. It's like a monthly uh, uh, a magazine, a newsletter that they, they walk around and they sell it. Do, do, they have, do they have a group of prophets or the president's the prophet or uh, do they have a pope? Do they have funny hats? 
<laughs> they have a, like a committee. Um, okay, uh, as I said, some of these things you're asking me now, I think we'll, we'll probably have these questions where we're going to go into more detail, but uh, that's the short answer. Okay, uh, and now anybody else want to react to what this says about the baptism question? Yes, um, you know, a lot of churches have their, you know, you have to go and you have to pass their, um, you know, you have to go to classes in order to see if you're saved or not before you're baptized. And so you have to go through their course. And, of course, if you're in a, if you're in a lordship church, then, then they have to show you that you are, you're, you're, you're working your way back to him. Um, and so, you know, there's, there are a lot of churches who uh, practice this um, uh, control if you will, uh, over over you know what they define as what your Christian walk and what your salvation means in order for you to conform with the uh, mothership. So um, this is you know this is getting your truth from one source and um, being uh, being told that if you you get it from another source, fear that you might you might be uh, condemned. So this is uh, total mind control here. Okay, brother, a good point. Um, if you say if you get it from another source, well, that is forbidden. In, in the uh, Watchtower Society, uh, every member is forbidden from reading anything regarding theology outside of their newsletters. Now, I'll join if they have a secret handshake. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, uh, let, pertaining to this, uh, this practice of baptism, let's look at some scripture now. Let's look at Acts uh, uh, 9, 17, and 18. And whoever finds it first, read it. Oh, it's to find a, find a thing again? Oh, man. Yeah. Mitch, you're a kind of a slow at finding verses in the Bible here. Yeah, I never know where they are. Usually, usually it's, it's Eric uh, and Jackson, the, the quickest. Yeah. What? Ding, 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 ding. It's in there somewhere. See, I'm, I'm cheating. I got the online Bible here, so I'm, I'm, I'm cheating. It's, it's, you guys are thumbing through tabs, and I'm, I'm typing. In. <laughs> I didn't even have tabs till Mitch mentioned it last week. Look what I, I got. I, yeah, I, I have, have tabs on my Bible. And those are beautiful tabs, Joe. Those excellent. Beautiful. Excellent job, Brother Joe. <laughs> well, that really makes me feel good, because I actually don't have any of that stuff. I just have this nice Sondervan uh, King James Bible with no tabs or study notes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. right. Chapter nine or something like that. Yeah, you said nine, seventeen, and eighteen. Acts nine, chapter nine, seventeen, and eighteen. Now uh, some of my notes are wrong, so hopefully this is a baptism verse. Uh, is this Ananias departed and, and entered the house, that, and after laying hands on him, said, "Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me." that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Does that have to do with baptism? Uh, yeah, did you read 18 also? 18, and immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he arose and was baptized. Okay. Okay, so what do we learn from that verse regarding comparing it to the system that the Jehovah Witnesses are using? Well, they well. Paul was blind before he was baptized, and they were blinded when they were baptized. <laughs> the, it's, it's, the question is the immediacy. Uh, as soon as Paul was saved, he was eligible to be baptized. Then, okay, he didn't mm -hmm. have to answer sixty questions, uh, you know, eighty questions. He didn't have to agree to all these doctrinal statements mm -hmm. and stuff. As soon as he got saved. And then he said he, he they went and got him baptized right then. He didn't get baptized before he got saved in order to be ge regenerated by water. He was saved and then immediately afterwards. But he didn't have to study, right. learn all their doctrines, and, uh, and then jump through all their hoops before he was eligible for water baptism. So you're saying that every saved person is eligible for water baptism. It's not... Yeah. Not, yeah. not, not even, not, not a special group of believers in any way, shape, or form, yeah. according now, to the Bible. Yeah, I am, and I, but I am saying I cited this verse, but I'm not so sure in this verse it really is even talking about water baptism. I try to take use the rule that uh, unless it says water, 
uh, or you know from the context that they're taking them to a lake or something, <laughs> that, that maybe we should assume it's spirit baptism. <coughs> but if this was water baptism, it tells you that he was eligible for water baptism right after he became a Christian, once he got right. saved. Well, right. you're all not worthy of baptism. Uh, that is coming from a guy who read that verse from an American Standard version, not the God who oh. came. <laughs> uh, oh. Wait a minute, hold on a second here. Now do we have uh, to divide the Bible to pick up over the here. paddle again? Yeah. Now let me tell you something. Uh, uh, at least nobody here is using the New World Translation. I got over. it. I'll get it right now. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, okay, do. let's go to let's go to Acts eight uh, eighteen eight and see what that says. Well, that's one page. That's a couple pages this way. Can you put the crickets on? I like them. I, all right, I've got it. Acts eighteen eight. Hey, I got it before the crickets were chirping. Yeah, but Mitch requested the the crickets. He did. He called out the crickets. <laughs> I let's call for the crickets. I like the crickets. <laughs> Very soothing, the crickets are. Yeah, they kind of are, unlike the clock. Yeah, the, yeah, the clock bothers me. Hey, everyone, welcome, Tanya. Hey, guys, sorry I'm late. I had hey, a Tanya. rough time with the kids tonight. That's fine. Uh, better late than not at all, so welcome. We, we, uh, it's only been, uh, uh, we, we just kind of gave our initial uh, reaction to, I mean, uh, thoughts on Jehovah's Witnesses, and then I did, you didn't see my public uh, confession, Tanya? No, I don't think so. Oh uh, yeah, I I had to start off by making a public confession that uh, uh, I am a Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, right. <laughs> and a Latter-day Saint. <laughs> and then Mitch said that he is too. And then then Mitch said that he is, and you know how Mitch and I are too like-minded, you know. And then Eric said he is, and then Jackson is. We're all Jehovah's Witnesses. And, and Latter-day Latter Saints, too. Yeah, we're Latter-day Saints, too. No, 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 I'm converting. I'm actually becoming Catholic, and I'm putting confessional outside. Yeah. Well, so I get... And it's when they don't come out the doors, they can pop the money yeah. in there. <laughs> but really, the point... I'm, I'm a Bible is Mark... Mark <laughs> but, you know, I guess... No, but Tanya, do you get what we're saying, though? I, she, she doesn't understand the... the she doesn't get the joke yet. Yeah. No. Jackson, why don't you why don't you tell her what we mean by that? Okay, what we're what what here's here's the joke. When you say the Bible's the mark of the beast thing, that proved you did not you do not understand the joke. So what the joke is is we're taking the technical definition of the terms that the groups are called. Latter day saint. Um yes, a saint in the latter days. That's us right now. Jehovah's Witnesses. Witnesses for the God of the Bible. Yes, that's what we are. <laughs> and we're, these groups are not what their names are. Yeah. Okay. Yes. okay. So, uh, Tanya, I guess you're a Jehovah's Witness. you got to admit it. Yep. That's fine with me. <laughs> yeah, we're here all to testify that Jesus Christ is Jehovah, our Savior God. Okay, uh, so now let's... Did anybody find that second verse? We're talking about... See, they say that... Uh, Tanya, they say that um, they have to... Uh, uh, jump through a bunch of hoops before they can be baptized. Uh, they've got to um, uh, gain doctrinal knowledge through systematic study of the Watchtower publications. They've got to pass an exam conducted by elders on over 80 questions concerning the doctrines of Jehovah Witnesses, and they must each uh, de de uh, uh, declare that any prior baptism was invalid. So those are the conditions for a Jehovah Witness to be baptized. And we're showing that the Apostle Paul, he got baptized right after he became saved immediately. That all that was required is that he was saved, and he was he didn't have to learn all the doctrines and jump through a bunch of hoops. So that now you're all caught up. Okay, what was the verse is Acts 18:8. Mm -hmm. It reads, "And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house." and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Okay, so uh, what do we get from that verse? Compare... Oh no, he's frozen again. No. I'm going to have to clone himself again to get out of this. 
while while Luke's gone, I'll just mention I'm it, I'm a member of the uh, Foursquare denomination, and it's part of the uh, practices. Then city preacher just joined the chat. <laughs> Luke, oh, you're a little Oh man, it's amazing. Oh, amazing. amazing. I, I was just saying that I'm a member of uh, the Foursquare denomination, or at least that's the last church I was a member of. And uh, practices and policy require class and uh, and confirmation before baptism, also. Yeah. Um, well, uh, but that's not there's that is not in the Bible. Now, um, the only requirement that we're going to find in the scriptures is that a person got saved. Uh, now, I do think that it's correct to to join a congregation. To be part of a congregation, uh, in fact, this is kind of what I did in this congregation we have right now. Uh, everybody to be on this panel had to kind of pass this test. We agree with these core beliefs, and we agree that the other doctrines we can uh, friend, have, have friendly disagreements. So that's the, that's the kind of the, te the test to be the requirement to be in this congregation. So I think that every local congregation has the right to, to lay down certain requirements before you can be a member and participate. Uh, but in order to be baptized, the only thing that's... Uh, by the way, is you guys still hearing me? Yes. I wasn't yeah. sure I was still hearing you. <laughs> uh, so we're finding from the scriptures there's nothing uh, stated that says that you've got to... Uh, uh, there's a list of requirements before water before water's allowed. You have to learn a secret handshake. Yeah. The secret handshake, you can't be baptized. Next no, what, what Have you saying, noticed the increasing level of comedy on this show, by the way? I, yes. I don't know. Sometimes I get in the mood. I'm just I'm just trying to figure out how we're supposed to confirm this handshake scene because none of us can shake hands. So yeah. um, I, I can't we can't oh, no. really um, <laughs> we must all be, we were all duped and damned. That's That's hard. Am I just supposed to shake my hand? Just shake my hand. Yeah. Like hey. Don't tell Eric about the secret meeting we had in Las Vegas. Yeah, no, I'm telling. See? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Talking to you guys anymore. Uh, now let's look at <laughs> now let let's look at Acts 16, 30 through 33. Uh, 30, and he took them that very hour and of the night and washed their wounds and immediately he was baptized. He had he and his whole household and his household. Yes. Okay. So what are we finding from these scriptures? I've got many more, but I don't want to spend too much time on this one doctrine here. There's many more examples that I could give you that say the same thing. And after baptized believed, right away. Right after they they believed very quickly, they went and got baptized. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, now let's move on to another doctrine. Unless someone has something to add on that. Okay, uh, the Watchtower Society claims that only the 144,000 individuals uh, a figure arrived at from the pages of the Book of Revelation can actually understand the Bible. It is an organizational book, a book given to an organization and not to individuals. It can be interpreted and explained only by God's own designated organization, the Watchtower Society. The organization's interpretations and explanations are found on the pages of the Watchtower publications. Okay, whoever wants to respond first, go ahead. Well, this is the same thing. Oh, go ahead, Joe. Uh, I was just curious if their doctrine changes. If I mean, the infallibility of the Pope and the Catholic Church doesn't really change their fundamental beliefs, and it sounds almost to me as a novice, like the JWs have a situation where they could actually change doctrine with the changing of the uh, uh, publication. Yeah, that's true. Their, uh, their publication is their scripture. Okay? Uh, so what about, uh, I'm surprised nobody said anything yet about the 144,000 and uh, their special uh, class of people. Yeah, they, they regard that, that by the time the end times are over, only 144,000 people are going to be saved. And that's entirely. Sort of. Um, sort of. Well, that's that's what I was told 
I mean, well, you're 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 <laughs> you're right. It's just that they all you're you're right. Bas ba basically, you're right. The only thing to add is the other Jehovah's Witnesses that were not um, that were not the 144,000 will still live some kind of life on a new earth or something. Well, see, then then that was a change because in the right. older doctrine, in the, the way the older doctrine was portrayed, mm -hmm. they were pushing people because that was the push to get as many people as they could to join. And then right. they came up with that very argument. People came to them and said, well, if only 444,000 are going to be saved, then how can you account for these other Jehovah's Witnesses? And they began running yeah. into this problem over and over again. Right, right. And they so, couldn't yeah. answer it. Yeah, there, um, there you go. So that, that really backs up what the, the answer being yes to what Jay was just asking, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, the, 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 the number 144,000 uh, became a problem to them after their membership had, had exceeded, exceeded 144,000. <laughs> Uh, because now, why would anybody else join if if only the first 144,000 can be saved? So that's when they changed it and said the first 144,000 they are going to be in heaven. The others can't get into heaven, but they'll have paradise on earth. Um, but what about the 144,000? What's uh, what? Who are they referring to? I mean, how did they come up with that number? I was the well, 12 tribes times so right. 12,000 from each tribe or thousand. Yeah. 12, of Israel. 12, let's, find, let's find the reference for that. Does anybody know where that is in the, in the scriptures? Yeah, That's that book I never read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's in there now. Right. 12,000, somewhere in there. It, it's got to be somewhere around uh, chapter 4 or 5 of Revelations, I think. I think I'm betting on Eric to find it first with his technology. Mm. You have technology, you'll find it. i got to get the Bible Hub. Ah, uh, come on. It's, it's, not, it's not cooperating with me. <laughs> uh -oh. I got my mouse. Wait a well, I can tell you without even reading the scriptures. I know, because you looked it up. That's not fair. I know. It's no, <laughs> no. This, is just I know it's the... this is just knowledge I have. The 144,000 referred to in the book of Revelation uh, is, is said to be made up of 12,000 individuals from right. each of the 12 tribes, 12 tribes. of Israel. Right. So this is 144,000 Jews who become saved and Christians during this tribulation period. Uh, yeah. How they can construe this to be the Jehovah Witnesses themselves, in, instead of seeing this clearly, uh, there have to be Jews and they have to be 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. It's just I, I don't know how they can ever sell that to anybody who understands what the if they read that particular verse in in uh, Revelation. Well, I think I think what they do is they do what some of the other uh, the other doctrines such as preterism or replacement theology do. Kingdom now theology is they eliminate the fact that current Israel as we know it is is in any way relevant mm -hmm. to Bible to the future uh, of right. prophecy. Right. So they have to eliminate that. They have to say that, well, the Israel you know now is totally irrelevant. That That's not really Israel. That's not uh -huh. what the Bible means by Israel in the end times. Totally. Okay. Uh, now, what about the fact that it says that only this 144,000 people are capable of understanding the Bible? That gives them a lot of power, doesn't it? Yeah. And that gives a lot of competition to try to be one of those people, doesn't it? Notice how it's actually very self-defeating, too, because if only 144,000, if you know that only 144,000 understand it, and you think you understand it, you're not sure if you understand it, because you're not sure if you're one of the 144,000. So it, that talk about killing of assurance. That seems like a pretty extreme example. Yeah. Uh, it, it, Mitch says that it gives them a lot of power. And it, and it certainly does, but it, can you think of any other group in, in history that has claimed that the, the population as a whole can't understand the Bible and they the have Catholics. to be... Who? The Catholics. And, and I might add that they were right for a long time until uh, the Gutenberg Bible, no one did understand it. They, they had to rely on the priests. 
Yeah, well, I think that the people could have understood it. It's not that they didn't have the ability. The problem was that there just weren't enough Bibles around. Even Martin Luther, uh, he didn't have scriptures for a long time, and once he finally got a hold of some scriptures and read them, he realized he could no longer be a Catholic. You know, right? So, they didn't uh, have access. They limited yeah, their supply. So, so the Roman Catholics had done the same thing. They basically said, "Look, you're not capable of understanding this. We'll explain it to you. Just, you just trust us." And it's the same thing the Jehovah Witnesses. They have this power over the, the, their population saying, we, we have to explain it to you, and we'll do it through our publications. Well, this is what Rashi does to the Jews. Rashi is the same thing. Um, Who? So, Rashi? Yeah, that's how they interpret the Bible. They interpret oh. the, Bible through, the Bible through Rashi. So, all, so they can't interpret the Bible by reading it themselves. They need to go to Rashi's commentary to understand the Bible. Oh, hey, Mitch, you've mentioned Rashi before, and I'm totally in the dark on that. Is that is that a a, a rabbi scholar of the past? Rabbi, rabbi Shimon, uh, what the hell? Uh, yeah, Shimon. Uh, I, I forget the last letter, but it's a an acronym uh, for for Rabbi Shimon something. Okay, let's let's look at a couple of verses here. I'm going to give each individual a verse to look up, if you're willing. Uh, anybody who doesn't want to do it, tell me. Uh, how about uh, First one will be First Corinthians. Uh, Joe, would you do First Corinthians two, four through sixteen? And Eric, will you do uh, John fourteen, uh, verses twenty five and twenty six? Uh, Jackson, will you do John sixteen, verses thirteen through fourteen? Mitch, you do First uh, Corinthians two nine through fourteen. And Tanya, are you still there? Okay. Uh, all right then. Once you find those, that way everybody will have one and it'll move them more quickly. So who, whoever finds one first, go ahead and tell me. Did you say nine, nine through fourteen? Nine through fourteen. Yeah. I for got it. This uh, end. Okay. I, 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 all right. I, I just got it. For for to this end also, I wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. But whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed. What I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for, the, for your sakes in the presence of Christ, in order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Now, when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a, when a door was opened for me in the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went to Macedonia, but thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of knowledge of him in every place. Okay, um, I think this is Paul talking about uh, where he didn't get the knowledge. I think if you go on, it'll probably say he didn't get knowledge from any of the apostles, that he got his knowledge straight from God. So oh, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, uh, he didn't that was in need, the Corinthians. He wrote that in another place, too, I believe. He said uh, that I didn't consult any of the other apostles before I went up. Yeah, that might be one of the other verses I assigned out there. But the idea is Paul, uh, he, he learned from this that man does not need another man to give him knowledge from God. God can give it to him directly, and a man man doesn't need some other man to interpret it for him. Okay, who has another verse? Okay, I got the, I got the John. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Jackson. Sorry, I got John 16, 13, and 14 here. Uh, through 15. Through 15. Through 15, okay, I've got that too. It reads, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will shew you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall shew it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall shew it unto you. Okay, this shewing or showing is making the point that the Holy Spirit will reveal things to man directly. We don't need the Watchtower Society to explain it to us. Okay, uh, and who has the next one? I got the uh, John 14 verse. Um, verse uh, John chapter 14 verse 25 and 26 says, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. 
But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Mm -hmm. So here again, Jesus is talking about he's about to leave them, and um, the Holy Spirit is going to come, and he's going to sh begin to start teaching them once Jesus is actually physically gone. So... Uh, again, and here's an important catch here. We keep bringing up the Holy Spirit here. We keep talking about the Holy Spirit, and this is kind of key because Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe the Holy Spirit as a person. They believe the Holy Spirit as a force, not an actual person of God. It, 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 they believe he is uh, that the Holy Spirit is a force. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, we're told through Scripture several times this is another personage, uh, it's the best word I can use, another person of, of God as Jesus Christ, the, the Trinity, three, three persons of one God. Yeah. So they, they fulfill different roles, but they're the same God. They're just God in different means. So they, they disregard that. They don't regard the Holy Spirit as an actual person who dwells in you. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's also, uh, we've learned from Mormonism, that their take on the Holy Spirit is not biblical either, and that they look at the Holy Spirit as a as a man without a body, just as we imagine ghosts when we watch movies, and they have a, a a personage. It's it's uh it's not physical, but it's shaped like a man. So, right. uh, yeah, they uh they just don't see these things the way the Bible says it is. Uh, okay, who has another verse that uh, those I gave out? Uh, I've got First uh, Corinthians two uh, four through sixteen. I think you said yes. Yes. I okay. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but were in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not rest on the wisdom of man, but upon the power of God. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom of God, which... Uh, predestined for before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for it is for if they had understood it, they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eyes have not seen, or ears not heard, and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of a man, which is in him? Even so, thoughts of God no one knows except for the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God. Which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts and spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Yeah, I gave you a lot of reading to do there, so you needed applause for that one. Uh, and how does that uh, whole part apply to this idea that uh, we don't need the watchtower to explain the Bible to us? Well, I think it goes along with the verse that uh, that exhorts that that the the gospel is not of private interpretation, or scripture is not of private interpretation. That uh, the Lord gave us His Word and His teachings through the Spirit, and uh, we need to the Spirit to understand the the Spirit of the Word. And so, uh, those who don't have the Spirit of the Word uh, are bound by the law. Uh, technical legalese instead of uh, poetry, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, good. Uh, anybody else want to comment on any of those verses we've read so far before I give you a couple more verses? Well, the Holy Spirit is the is the factor here that that, that separates us from from every other. You know, we we can we can I can I can give you the Sears catalog and make you follow that. 
But without, the, you know what I mean? If you, you don't have the Holy Spirit and you're in some sort of religion, I can make up a book like the Book of Mormon or I could, I could rewrite the Bible like the Jehovah's Witnesses or I can give you my idea of the doctrine. And if I can get enough people to follow it, those people are blind. Without the Holy Spirit, these words mean nothing anyway. It would be easy to, to lead people who don't have the, that are blind to begin with. Okay, uh, let's look up this verse here, Second uh, Timothy two fifteen. Second Timothy, I was just in that book. Okay, I got that one. Second uh, Timothy chapter two verse fifteen. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, uh, so now we have the Jehovah Witness saying, don't study, we'll study, we'll, do, uh, we'll figure it out, and we'll teach you through our publications. <laughs> but the Bible tells, exhorts each one of us to study on our own. Yes, and let me just say something. Listening to other people preach what they think is not studying. And I learned that the hard way. Um, but I have finally come to that realization. Yeah. It's not to say that we cannot learn from each other, uh, but, uh, oh, by the way, uh, Tony, I made a comment on your video today about the Bereans. Uh, did you get that? what I was saying there? Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, because uh, the you know, here, um, what we should do is, uh, whatever anybody put idea someone puts forth, uh, we should consider it. But when Paul preached to the the city of Berea, they all received pa Paul's message and they're all happy about it. But after Paul left, even the apostle Paul, they were not going to just take it for granted that he had the truth. They went and searched the scriptures for themselves to see if what he said was really there. And that's the, that's the example that we should all follow is we need to study the scriptures ourselves. It's okay to discuss and learn from each other, but we've got to test what everybody says by the scriptures. Well, really quick, uh, really quick, I just wanted to build on something that uh, Brother Mitch was saying. Um, and we go right back to the original verse. We talked about the scales coming off of Paul's eyes, and this is the exact description. You know, we, we say to ourselves sometimes, how can the world be so blind? The truth is right there in front of them. Well, they are blind. They really are blind. It's as if they have scales on their eyes. They don't. They cannot see the truth because they will. They are not allowed to see the truth until they actually seek the truth through the proper the proper uh, channel, which is God. So, which who Jesus Christ. So, the, the, it, literally, the scales fell from their eyes. It is a blindness. Without the Holy Spirit, you can't hope to to relieve that blindness. Yeah, a couple of things come to my mind when, when you talk about the blindness. Uh, Jesus said, m I believe more than once, he referred to people, they have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. I think all of us in our own um, witnessing and ministries here, we have dealt with people who have ears, but they don't hear. They just tune you out. All they want to do is talk. They never really will even consider what you're saying. And... Mm -hmm. Uh, he also said, talked about these people uh, as casting our pearls to the swine. It's it, it just you're better off not even talking to people. Once you discern that it's a waste of time, then find someone who does have ears to hear instead. All right, you ready for the next uh, doctrine they have? Transferring blood from the veins or arteries of one person to another is equivalent to feeding up upon or eating the blood and is unscriptural causing loss of eternal life. Thus, if a person receives a blood transfusion, he will not inherit a place in the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. well, interesting how the first thing that stands out to me, now we're probably going to get into whether or not it's okay to take a blood transfusion with the conclusion being that it is, but interesting how when they said he doesn't have a place in the kingdom of God, notice how they're implying that keeping a certain commandment is required to be saved there, contradicting faith alone. Well, uh, yeah. It shows a lack of understanding. 
it really does show a lack of understanding for what that sacrifice, what, what that was actually pointing to and why you, right. you weren't supposed to drink blood. When Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood, it was because it was said that you can't eat the animal's blood because the life of the animal is in it. So you could do all the sacrifices, but you couldn't eat of that animal's or drink that animal's blood because it didn't have salvation in it. So this was a sign. So it has nothing to do with transfusions because the blood that we receive, that we eat or drink or whatever, is of Christ when we get the Holy Spirit. So, it, so actually, if you really understood that that was a sign to show us that Christ is the blood that, 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 that you can have, then they would understand that the transfusion, not transfusion, even if I drank blood, which it was forbidden, but it was only it was only because it was only because it was a sign that you couldn't drink a lamb's blood or whatever. And so, um, so now they're looking at it like, well, now it, it goes back to the Old Testament and it goes back to this uh, superstition or whatever you are or you see, but it really doesn't make any sense because we already have gotten the blood of Christ. And so that's the only blood that we You know, that, that's a good point. And, and building on that, you know, one of the interesting conundrums they create with that is, okay, well, conversely, could I make the argument that if a saved person gives blood to an unsaved person, the unsaved person becomes saved because they got a saved person's blood? Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, do you see the, the window you can open there? If, I, if it was a Jehovah's Witness that gave blood to somebody who's not a Jehovah's Witness, would that be a good thing? The thing so, is, maybe I mean, they would say that by giving blood, maybe they'd say by giving blood, because I, I don't believe they believe in eternal security. We'll get to that maybe later, but mm -hmm. I th maybe they'd say that if a, if a saved person is giving blood, they're no longer saved. Or maybe they'd say a saved person would never give blood, I don't know. So therefore they might say that's a, a moot point, but your point still definitely holds water. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, the idea you brought up, Eric, was uh, interesting. The con conversely, how you flipped it around, that was a good point. Uh, I'd like to back up to what Mitch said. Uh, I know Mitch was there. I'm not sure who else was uh, there when we did this series called uh, uh, Old Testament Pictures and Shadows of Jesus' Blood Atonement. But we worked our way right from... Uh, Genesis 1 all the way through and showed all of the pictures of the future uh, sacrifice that Jesus would make and you know Mitch I don't remember us discussing the, the blood in this way then the way you pointed it out why was drinking the blood for, forbidden uh, what it, it wasn't for a health reason that uh, that I that I would I'm assuming I don't think that the uh, the blood was any more unhealthy than just eating the meat but they're talking it's forbidden Maybe it had to do with what you cited. It's a picture of the the life being in the blood and the and uh, Jesus's life giving us life, his shed blood. Right. I, I I do believe that that's one of the reasons why. And a lot of other uh, rituals were out there where you were drinking the spirit of the animal. Right. That that's that's actually what I was going to go, Mitch. I was going to say I think one of the things they wanted you to avoid was the pagan uh, the pagan ideas that were out there that were specifically drinking blood for those purposes. They were doing it because they believed they gained something from the animal, or they gained something. A warriors who would kill other warriors would drink their blood or eat their flesh or organs because they believed they gained something by that. It was a pagan thing. That, that actually that actually just was in the news. That just happened where the Muslim Brotherhood ate a Christian's heart or something in Syria as a sign to everybody. Uh, so it's still going on, I guess. Wow, that's amazing. But but the major scripture here is that the blood is in the the life is in the blood of the animal. So if life is in the blood, whether they pagan sacrifice or whatever it was, the idea here is that life was in the blood, and you can't. Drink the the blood of a, of a bull or a ram. So when Jesus came and said, "They will eat my flesh and drink my blood," they were drinking the life of Christ. So those signs and sacrifices, and it seems to fit that you wouldn't you wouldn't drink the blood of a bull and a ram because that would you know that that wouldn't show that that you know it would it would show that 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 Christ is the is the only blood that you could eat or drink or whatever not that we drink his blood but through the holy spirit we get his we get the same it's the same symbolism mm -hmm. i think that uh, both uh, Mitch and Eric points are are valid to as i see it uh, how you the reason for saying don't drink the animal's blood one is that they, they there's other examples of them making a rule 
only because they said, this is what pagans do. Don't do it. You guys are different. You're going to do things differently because we don't want anybody confusing you with the pagans, okay? So that would go along with what Eric said, and then the idea of the life being in the blood and Jesus' blood sacrifice, I, I think that that's another double application of that. Well, that's, that's also, real quick, and then I'll let you continue, real quick, that's, that's also where people have some um, uneducated arguments about when they want to point out things Christians say or they say Old Testament-wise you shouldn't do, such as tattoos, earrings, shaving your head, things of that nature, because these were things specifically they were told not to do because the pagan cultures were doing things that, that those things because it meant something in pagan culture. Uh -huh. When they wore these things decoratively, when they shaved their heads, when they tattooed their bodies, it wasn't like somebody getting a Superman tattoo today. It was like it was yeah. th these tattoos meant something. They were tribal. They were pagan. They had to do with their deities and their beliefs. And so he didn't want them associated with Luke was saying it was absolutely true. He did. They did not want them associated with that. And what something comes to my mind, Eric, is uh, in the last days, the mark of the beast is a mark upon the body. So I mean, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, okay. Um, I'm going to give you three scriptures. Uh, Joe, could you take Mark 7.15? Uh, Eric, you take Matthew 15.11. Jackson, you take Romans 6.14. And I guess we'll do... Uh, Mitch, you do uh, uh, Leviticus 17.14. And Tonya, you do Romans 10.4. And whoever goes finds it first, go ahead. Uh, Mark seven fourteen is uh, and he uh, and after he called the multitude to to him again, he began saying to them, "Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside the man which is going to defile him, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile him." Maybe I read that wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, there is nothing outside the man which is going to defile him, which can defile him, but the things which proceed out of the man will defile him. I don't know. This version sounds a little goofy to me, but oh, no, that's, it, it's that's okay. Right. But how does that statement there apply to the the subject we're on right now? The, the simple act of the blood transfusion is not going to defile a person. That's not what defiles the person any more than. Uh, well, you you pulled you had me pull up the Matthew verse, which goes right alongside what Joe read, which is Matthew chapter fifteen, uh, verses eleven, where he, Jesus says, "Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth the man, but that which cometh out of the mouth this defileth the man." A lot of people stop that as a one-line reference and say, "Well, that means you know, obviously filth and whatever." No, it it's not talking about food because the argument there was they were arguing about food originally. It was because they had. Uh, uh, picked grain, and they, did, they were eating with unwashed hands, and they were getting picked on because of that, and he was making a speech about this. It's not what goes into you that defiles you. It's what comes from the heart. We talked about this previously. It starts with the heart. It's what comes out of you, the evil in your heart. That's what defiles you. So a blood transfusion doesn't defile you any more than eating something or anything else. It's what's in the person themselves, who they in their heart, that or as we say, their, their spirit, their person. That's what defiles the person. Well, see, here's the other thing. Here's, here's just just a, 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 a food for thought with that in mind is back in, like you just mentioned very astutely about they weren't allowed to do certain things in the Old Testament because it was a, because the only reason someone would have done it back then would be to associate with these pagan cultures and everything. Now, I think that's what amounted to also the, the pork and the shrimp being, uh, being forbidden to eat because I'm sure that's what the other cultures were eating and stuff. But here's the, here's the, the interesting thing is I guess maybe it's a moot point because they, they, of course, didn't have the technology back then, but I can't imagine God ever disapproving of a blood transfusion. Like if there was some way they could have done that back in the Old Testament, I can't imagine him being against that, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I think the uh, it, when we understand that the, when the Bible says the life is in the blood, and then to turn around and say someone needs a blood transfusion, it'll save their life, and to refuse it. <laughs> when the Bible says life is in the blood, that should encourage us saying, give them blood, that'll give them life, you know, instead of forbidding it. 
Yeah, I had that discussion with someone in reference to the fact that they had they had a big problem. Forget who it was. It was a little while back, but they found out I was an organ donor, and said, "Oh, you shouldn't do that. You should." I said, "Why would I not do that? Why would I not give somebody the opportunity to have perfectly healthy eyes, or perfectly healthy kidneys, or perfectly healthy lungs, or liver? Why would I deny that person another person a chance?" You know, the way I saw it as, you know, what if? the organ that's donated from me goes to a person which gives them enough time so they go on to be saved. I mean, you know, people don't think of it in that regard. They think, no, you're, you're not, that belongs to you. And it was some of those ideas that people say, you know, I, I was one of my my uh, father-in-law's relatives, I think it was his mother or somebody used to tell him, say, well, I'm, I don't want to get cremated because I'm afraid God won't be able to put me back together. <laughs> I said, that's ridiculous. Okay. Yeah, no, but this, this, is, this is the mindset that people think with. They, they think so limited. They think so, you know. Well, I was, when you were saying that, I was wondering, in the resurrection, you're going to be missing an organ. <laughs> yeah. I'm an organ donor, too, by the way. <laughs> I... It, it's it's it seems ridiculous to me. Of course, God would want me. I have no use of those organs after I'm gone. Uh, my body, I'm gonna I'm gonna get a new body. I'm not concerned with that stuff. You know, I, I'm sure God's gonna do just fine with me lending my organs to somebody else. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what about the other verses, uh, Jackson? You didn't read yours yet. Uh, hold on, just one moment. Okay. I just mm -hmm. had it. My Bible just accidentally closed. Mitch, was... you, got, you got yours, Mitch. I've got what it this uh, 17, 14 in Levit Leviticus? For, uh, for as for the life of all flesh, its blood is identified with its life. Therefore I said to the sons of Israel, you are not to eat the blood of any flesh, for the life of all flesh is its blood. Whoever eats of it shall be cut off. Okay, so let me ask this. Uh, let's say that you guys... We're in the Watchtower Society, not real Jehovah Witnesses like me, but you're these uh, apostate Jehovah Witnesses in the Watchtower, and you're uh, uh, you're saying you can't have any blood transfusions or eat blood, and but you've been you haven't been a vegetarian your whole life. You've been eating uh, meat products too. I mean, obviously there's still some animal blood in all the meat that we eat. So doesn't that kind of blow the whole concept unless you become a, a strict vegetarian? I love those blood sausages, man. Yeah. That, that's, that's very much like uh, the uh, Islamic people. Uh, the, some, someone was saying rub some pig fat on your bullet before you shoot them. But they don't have it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Jackson, you got yours now? It's 6. What verse did you say? Uh, Romans 6.14. Okay, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. My favorite verse. Yeah. Okay. Hey. There you go. And, and, and let me say, I can, I can easily see why Mitch would love that verse. <laughs> yeah, we don't we all love that verse, though? But the, what's the point of that verse pertaining to this topic? Actually, for me, it's always been a hard verse, believe it or not, because I've always I've always heard this verse preached to teach lordship salvation. See, your life's not going to be dominated by sin if you do this, but I don't know exact what the opposite. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the the reason why the reason why sin doesn't have any dominion over you is because you're no longer under the whip of lordship. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's it's because it's because that the law doesn't matter. It was removed. Right. Because the law was removed, you now can worship in spirit and in truth out of love, and and in that way you don't gratify the sinful nature. Okay, I think we're we're uh, focusing on the wrong part of the verse relevant to favorite. the topic. <laughs> relevant to the topic. The topic is these uh, watchtower people. Uh, I hate to even call them Jehovah Witnesses because I know they're really not really witnesses. JFWs, as, as yeah, Jack said. Yeah, J, yeah let me call them JWs. Good idea. JFWs for false. Oh, man. That's, what, that's what Jack smacked. I, I, I thought the F was for something else, but since Joseph didn't say it, you know, I, I shouldn't have taken it that way. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. JFW is standing for false is what Jack Smack 77 always puts on video saying like exposing JFWs. Yeah. JFWs at my door and stuff. All right. 
Okay, but the point I'm making is they're putting some legalistic requirement on their members saying this is against the law or against our, our religious law for you to do that. And yet this verse says that we're not under the law. We're under, we're under grace. Okay? Uh, now let me see uh, um, who else hasn't read their verse yet? Mitch or Tanya? I have one. Okay. All right. Romans 10, 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Good verse. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they're, they're imposing this legalism on their members, and yet the scriptures say, uh, don't put people under bondage. Okay, uh, move on to another uh, Watchtower Doctrine, unless you want to say something more about the blood. Okay. Um, in Watchtower society, born again means going to heaven. This privilege is limited to Jesus and the 144,000 spiritual brothers and sisters chosen since Jesus' time. The remainder of the Jehovah's Witnesses do not become born again, but are assigned to the designation the other sheep and will remain on the earth forever. Uh, we talked about that briefly before, uh, and so now it's time to go into it more thoroughly. Your first impression of that again. Um, yeah, well, John one just blows that out of the out of the water because he he said that that anyone who believes in Jesus Christ has the right to become a child of God, a child not born of flesh and blood, but born of the Spirit. Mhm. Mm okay. Uh, the thing that sticks out to me in this statement here also, you got the term born again, but what's this other term, the other sheep? Uh, so they've got their 144,000 are born again and go to heaven, and then you've got all the other sheep, and they can't go to heaven, but they'll live on earth in a, in a paradise situation. But So in other, words, in other words, you can be a true witness of Jehovah and not be born again, according to their theology. Yeah. And, and at least their theology now. As we talked about, there was the change, and Eric brought that up and clarified that for everyone. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about right now. So right now, they're saying that you can be a true witness of Jehovah and not be born again. Yeah. Uh, what about this term, the other sheep? Can you think of anybody else has, who has misapplied the term the other sheep? I can't, but I, biblically speaking, I think it's referring to the Gentiles, isn't it? Uh, I think it is, but uh, I'm thinking of another group who uses the term other sheep in another way that like they're using it. The Catholics? Nope. The Mormons. The Mormons oh. believe that the other sheep are when Jesus uh, after the resurrection he went to America and he, he preached to the other sheep. I never knew that. Yeah. So uh, that's where that's how they get that uh, uh, they put that together. That's why Jesus went there, because he needed to preach to the others. So they both, they both take the term the other sheep and get this group of people and have to uh, misapply it uh, rather than understanding that this is just talking about uh, you've got the Jews and the Gentiles, and now salvation is not just to the Jews, it's also to the Gentiles. Uh, let's, uh, let's go to uh, um, Joe. Look up John 10, 15 and 16. Uh, Eric, look up John 3, verses 3 and 5 and 6. Um, and Jackson, you look up Revelation 7, 4. And Mitch, you look up Ephesians 2, uh, 1 and 2. And Tanya, you look up John 3, uh, 5, 8, no, 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 we already looked at that. Look at Titus 3, 5. Uh, you say Ephesians 2 what, Luke? Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. Oh, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked 
according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit, um, of the spirit that is now working in those uh, in the sons of disobedience. That's one and two. Okay. Uh, so, but doesn't doesn't it say uh, after that, that that we're quickened? Is that well, where it says? It said quickened? read uh, Ephesians two one and two, so I can go on. Yeah, I'm 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 not perfect in my notes I took here. <laughs> Sorry. Um. Let's see. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even okay. as the rest. All right, that's God not being rich in His mercy because of His great love, which He had loved us, even when we were dead in our sins and transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and uh, raised up from the dead, yada, yada. Yeah, what we're looking for is uh, uh, the idea of being born again. We were dead spiritually, and that's why we needed to born again. Uh, we need our spirit to be quickened, brought to life. Uh, but I didn't give you a good verse for that. Okay, who has another one? I've got Revelation 7, 4. Okay, that's says, that. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Read the next verse too. It says, of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand, of the tribe of Reuben were sealed twelve thousand, of the tribe of Gad were sealed twelve thousand. Okay, you don't need to go on. It continues showing you every one of the twelve tribes had twelve thousand uh, people sealed. So uh, we discussed this earlier, but their their viewpoint on who this 144,000 is nothing like what the Bible says who they who they are. Um, all right. Uh, before I go on, if anybody wants to elaborate on these, uh, I don't want to rush through them. Uh, next verse. Uh, Johnny, uh, John 10, 15. Johnny, is unbelievable. <laughs> So such disrespect for the Apostle John. <laughs> ah, you want to go to hell, boy? <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was scary, Mitch. Hey, that's... the reprobate. <laughs> Jay Byron <laughs> just called John a heretic. <laughs> no. He's the heretic. Again, right? We're going to divide again, too, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, sorry, no, sorry. Go ahead. Even even as the father knows, even as the father knows me, and I know the father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, that they may hear my voice, and they shall become one flock with one shepherd. Okay. So this talks about making them into one fold. So there's not a hundred and forty-four thousand that get to go to heaven, and everybody else is out of luck, you know, because there, uh, there, there's one fold. He brings both groups in equally into one fold. But I was trying to make a joke that uh, even though Joe called uh, the Apostle John Johnny, I never stoop so low to call James Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> that was bad, Luke. Like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you see the point here is how they differentiate between this 144,000 and the rest, uh, and then, but here in the scriptures, it says, no, they're one fold. Okay, who's got the next verse? Okay, next uh, verse? Oh, Did you ahead. say the next, next verse? One, I, I signed verses out. Oh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Tony. All right, uh, Titus 3 5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Okay, so this is uh, through the Holy Spirit that we get this new birth. Uh, all right, well, and I would, we actually jumped ahead on that one, but okay, who has another one? 
Uh, the, you have me have uh, John chapter 3, verses 3 and 5 and 6. Verse 3 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He continues in verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. In verse 6 says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Okay. So um, we're, we're looking at verses that talk about being regenerated, born again, brought to life, and we, we want to compare that to how the Jehovah Witnesses believe born again is and who is born again. Okay, who has another one? Uh, did everybody read their verse? Uh-huh. Okay. All right, let's look at the uh, another doctrine. Uh, that The true church is made up of the 144,000 individuals purchased uh, from the earth by Jesus Christ, those not belonging to the church but who follow the principles set forth by the Watchtower Society are called the great crowd. They follow the directions of the 144,000 in preaching the good news or gospel of the kingdom. Uh, so here we have them saying that not only do they have, are they called the other, what was the term that we used, the other sheep, but they're also referred to as the great crowd. Uh, what is this great crowd in the scriptures, though? The 144,000? Is that what you're asking? Who is yeah. the 144,000? No, no. The great crowd and the 144,000, are those the same thing in the scriptures? Uh, can anybody look up, do a search on the great crowd? And I believe that there's a great yeah. crowd of witnesses uh, for one of the raptures or the resurrections. I believe the great crowd that you're referring to uh, in Revelations is referring to the martyrs. <laughs> A great crowd of witnesses in heaven uh, that called uh, for uh, God to finish things up. If I'm thinking right. Yeah, yeah. If if uh, you can find that, the search for the term "great crowd" and and uh, "great crowd of witnesses," and I think that their definition of who the great crowd is uh, is different than than what uh, the scripture say. I think that what you're talking about is Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, where it says, After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Is that what you're referring to? That's what I was referring to, I think. Yeah. So uh, you see how they'll take terms like 144,000, the other sheep, and uh, the great crowd, and they will misrepresent what that is. If you study the scriptures and you look at the context of it all, it clearly doesn't mean what the Watchtower Society is teaching it means. Well, one of the questions I have about the 144,000 in regard to their teaching is, do they completely ignore the fact that the Bible separates them into the 12, the 12 tribes of Israel and groups of 12,000? Do they even talk about how there's 12,000 of various of the various tribes? Do they mention a separation or is it just all, all I ever hear them talk about is one big group of 144,000? And not only that, but to follow that too, Eric, since they're the people who they're the people these other these other sheep are the people who are following the hundred and forty four thousand. I would like to ask: are, that must mean, I guess, that the Watchtower um, high ups, the Watchtower people who are high in the in the um, organization, are the one hundred forty four thousand. And my question is, have they done a blood test to know that they're all of Jewish ethnicity and from all these tribes and everything? My guess would be no. <laughs> yeah, well, there, the, my point exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like, we'll say something and I'll build on top of it. This is becoming a pattern. You know, when I've talked to Jehovah's Witnesses, I'm, uh, I've never gotten far enough with them to actually get to that point where I ask them, could you tell me how you can explain this 40, 144,000? It clear, clearly says that these are 12,000 from, from each tribe of Jews, and uh, I've never asked them or been able to get that far with them. So I don't know how they answer that, really. 
but uh, but clearly the scripture says one thing and it doesn't really it's one of those things in scriptures where uh, it's so clear how could you mis misunderstand it <laughs> okay here's another uh, teaching uh, uh, only those members of the 144,000 mentioned in Revelation 6 4 remaining on the earth at any given time can partake of in the communion supper the bread and the cup members of the great crowd or earthly class as the society designate those witnesses not among the 144,000 are forbidden to take communion supper and now that does the what we've discussed before you know who's eligible to take communion what kind of requirement do you have to have in order to take communion yeah Luke how do, how do they know who to give communion to I mean do they pre know who the 144,000 is I mean we're talking generation to generation I don't think they get a new 144,000 with each generation well, if they, if you look at when they first formed and they got their uh, first one and it counted them off to through their first 144,000, that time was already passed. So I guess they have to conclude that no one else today gets communion. I mean, I'm just making a logical uh, extrapolation because uh, I don't know. I've never talked to one, but this here says their doctrine is that you, only the original 144,000 can take communion. But what the scriptures tell us is is the test for taking communion. We discussed it. Same thing. Problem with Mormonism. There, they have their own uh, take on who's eligible for communion. Now, now uh, you see Jehovah Witnesses have another set of rules. Who can get the communion? But what does the scripture say? Who who gets it? Let's look at uh, Joe. You'd look at First Corinthians six ten verses sixteen and seventeen. Uh, Eric, you take Acts 2, 41 through 42, and Jackson, you take 1 Corinthians 11, 26. This is embarrassing. Look, can you repeat my verse? I'm 1 Corinthians what? Uh, 10, uh, uh, chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. Thank you, Brad. What chapter? You said 14, 26, sir? Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 26. Jackson. Okay, I got sick because the first because you also said it to Jays. That's why I got mixed. No, right. for both First Corinthians. So we're like all the dyslexic in our brains. So you got to be real slow with this. I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> exactly. I, I missed mine too. I'm sorry. I got mine. I got mine. So this is what happened <laughs> when you tried to go to First Corinthians. <laughs> I didn't get. I didn't get far enough to. Get, I only had three of them for this right now. So. Oh, okay. Shoot. I'm so Thanks. glad because I the pressure's off of us. We don't have to. <laughs> Don't put the click the clock on Luke. <laughs> okay. I got I got the Acts chapter two okay, forty one and forty two. Um, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Okay. So um, there's no. Um, list of requirements before they can break the bread and have communion in, in that verse there. Uh, who, who has, Jackson, you got yours or Joe? I've got mine. 1126 says, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye show, ye shew the Lord's death till he come. Okay, so we, we do it in remembrance of him and, and now Jack, uh, Joe? Uh, I believe mine starts, is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing of the blood of Christ? Is not the bread of which we break sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we are many, and we many are one body, for we partake of one bread. Okay, so all believers are to partake of communion, and we're supposed to continue partaking until Jesus returns. That's what we're getting from these verses. Uh, the, nowhere in, in the scriptures is there a test where, like the Roman Catholics say, that you have to go to confession to the priest and get the, the have the priest forgive your sins before you can be eligible to take communion. And now these Jehovah Witnesses, their test is only the original 144,000 can take it. And the Mormons say that uh, they have you have to follow all their ordinances and be a member in good standing. So. Uh, 
uh, you see how they're all making up legalism requirements before you can even uh, take communion. And as we discussed last time, uh, I think everybody agreed. Uh, to me, every time I eat, I'm taking communion because every time I break bread or uh, drink anything, I, I'm saying grace, I'm remembering Jesus and the sacrifice. So I, they, it seems like everybody wants to formalize it and make it in some kind of uh, uh, legalized, legalized um, legalistic uh, approach to it instead of just, hey, every time you eat and drink, remember Jesus and his sacrifice for you. And that's what we do when we eat. I was always terrified to take communion. I, I grew up in a very legalistic church, and they were always quick to remind everybody in the service, if you have unconfessed sin, uh, this could kill you. Yeah, I grew, I grew up with that. I mean, my parents were not super legalistic, but that was my understanding growing up. Is that maybe not kill unless it was something really, really bad, but I thought that unconfessed sin made you unworthy to eat communion, and I still am not... Frankly, I'm still not sure exactly in terms of what being worthy and unworthy for communion means exactly. And we sometime else could maybe have a talk about that. Uh -huh. Well, there is uh, one case where uh, someone, Paul talked about people getting sick or dying or something in communion and that they had to, uh, I forgot what he said to them. Does anybody recall what it was and where, where it is? I recall what it was. Uh, it was uh, many are taking communion in an unworthy manner, and uh, so some of you are uh, even sick or dying as a result of it. I mean, that's the Joe paraphrase. Yeah. Yeah, they were getting drunk uh, at the feasts. So oh, like, that's a right. Little bit, it was sort of like, like kind of like the way I could do communion after I get home from work. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think that's right, Mitch. I think that, I think I remember oh, that. Oh. <laughs> I think that's more offensive than Jay's calling him Johnny. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Let, let that one go. Come on. Okay, that's time. Uh, that was I'm going to say Jiminy, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy Cricket. James! James! Uh, I'm trying to save everybody. We'll move on. I save everybody from any kind of embarrassment here. Another one is uh, the current teaching of the Watchtower Society is the cross is a pagan symbol and was not the instrument of death used by the Romans to kill Jesus. Jesus died on a torture stake or pole. The cross does not picture the death or the resurrection of Jesus. It is not the Christian symbol, nor is it a symbol of hope. I remember uh, someone that I used to listen to quite a bit. Uh, I really still have a fondness for him. It was J. Vernon McGee. And uh, he was he was a doctor that had a radio show. Yeah. But he, he had and may I say? Yes, may I say? That's right. I love him. Uh, but anyway, he uh, had a whole dissertation where he felt Christ was crucified on a stake rather than a cross. But it was uh, the uh, you know it's it's irrelevant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This, the, there's some of the things that you can say it's irrelevant, or if if it's not irrelevant, it's less relevant. Uh, uh, and uh, I've, I've heard probably every one of uh, Vernon McGee's uh, messages, and I love him, uh, but I think he's wrong on this one. Hey, I guess I don't agree with him 100%. <laughs> uh -oh. just, just remember, yeah, yeah. Luke, on, on YouTube there's a great mob of witnesses. <laughs> yes. The thing about yeah, what mob is the crowd. Sometimes it seems like he's being really clear on grace, and I'm like, I love this and everything. I, I feel like similarly to him as Charles Stanley, and then he'll turn around and say something else, and I'll be like, oh, why did you say that, J. Vernon McGee? Yeah. <laughs> what does the J stand for, by the way? John. J. It's John. It, it, John. Uh, oh. My, my oh, favorite J. Vernon McGee quote I use in one of my videos is, He's seen the gospel preached with a cigarette, but he's never seen it effectively done with a bikini. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. He's... Well, here's the interesting thing about, the, I guess the last thing before you go back to the Jehovah's Witness thing is, on my video about bad news theology, I linked to his very short, only four-minute video back archived from his radio station on ultra or hyper dispensationalism, and I thought he, in in just a short amount of time, gives a very very good answer to it. So, well, we're going to give a good answer now. Um, let's look at uh, 
Joe, well, let's go with Mitch first because he didn't get one last time. Oh. Mitch, you got you got John twenty John! verse yeah, twenty-five. John <laughs> and Tanya. Tanya? Yes. You've got John twenty one verses eighteen and nineteen. Joe, you got Matthew twenty seven thirty seven. <clears throat> Eric, you got Mark fifteen verses twenty five through twenty seven. Okay. So that was John what there? Uh, you're the first one. John twenty verse twenty five. Twenty twenty five. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's start with you, Mitch, or whoever finds it first. Go ahead. And they put up above his head the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Which, uh, which one did you read? Uh, Matthew 27, 37. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, the point here is that uh, it, the, it says the Romans placed a sign above Jesus' head, not above his hands. Uh, in other words, if, if his hands were up on a stake like this, the sign would have been above his hands. You see, the, you see how that disputes the idea that it was a pole. If his hands were on a pole, and then it would have said that they put the sign above his hands, not above his head. Okay, uh, who's next? Uh, the other disciples, once it's uh, 2025 here. Yeah. The, the other disciples therefore were saying to him, We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place with, of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after the eight days, his disciples were inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came. Uh, came and the doors having been shut and stood in their midst and said peace be with you then he said to Thomas reach here your finger and see my hands and reach here your hand and put it into my side and be not believing but be not unbelieving but believing and Thomas said to him my Lord and my God okay I only wanted verse 25, but it well, I, I, I had to fill it in there. It doesn't. It doesn't you well, can't stop at 25. Okay. It's, <laughs> and scriptures are like peanuts, you know. You just can't eat just one. It's got to fill uh, in the blanks. For okay. Uh, but the point here is that it says uh, the nails. Read the first verse 25, and when you get to the word nails, read. everybody pay close attention to that. Okay. Uh, unless I see... In his hands, the imprint of the nails, and okay. put my finger. The nails. In other words, the imprint of the nails. If he was on a pole, they would have put one nail through both hands. And this says his hands had nails, plural. So th these are ways that you can see just uh, that uh, these are descriptions of being on a cross, not on a pole. Okay, who's next? I got the Mark 15 uh, reference, Mark 15, 25 through 27. <clears throat> and it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. Okay. Uh, so it's saying on his right hand, not on his right side. So we can we can deduce from that that his hands were outstretched. He was off to his right hand rather than just on the right side. Now this this may not be nailing down perfectly, but I, I think if he was on a pole, then these things would have been worded differently to express express that you know, we would have been able easily deduced that it was a pole, not a cross. Okay, who's next? All right, I got mine. John twenty one. 18, verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto them, or unto him, follow me. 
I'm not sure I have the right thing here. Is that talking about Jesus' death, or is that talking about uh, Peter or Paul? That was uh, that was Peter, I believe. But it's about it's, Peter's death. Yeah, but I do believe that it was saying that stretch out your hands was like die like me, because yeah. Okay. okay. That King James English uh, is really hard to follow sometimes. Yeah. Well, uh, thou thou speakest so, but not needest not. <laughs> okay. Uh, does uh, someone else have another verse? Or we finish with that. Uh, okay. Let's look at. Okay. Here's here's do. Let's do four more here. Uh, Joe, you do First Corinthians one verses eighteen twenty three. Uh, Eric, you do First Corinthians two two. Jackson, you do Philippians three eighteen and nineteen. Mitch, you do Galatians six fourteen. And Tanya, you do Matthew sixteen twenty four. All right, I got mine. Matthew 16:24. Yeah. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Okay, wait, wait, wait. He's supposed. To, you're, we're supposed to pick up our our pole and follow him, aren't we? <laughs> okay. The Bible says cross. It doesn't say pole. Who's next? Uh. Chapter 6, but may it never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me. And wait, I, well, I thought it was supposed to say boast in the pole of the Jesus pole. Christ. Does it say cross or pole? It says pole right here. <laughs> <laughs> it probably says pole in the, in the New World Translation. It says it in the New World Translation, Luke. What's the matter with you? <laughs> Let me write it in there. Wait a minute. Okay, who has the next one? Luke, I'm embarrassed. Can you repeat mine? Uh, yeah, I think you were first <laughs> Corinthians 1, 18, and 23. Thanks. And uh, you have yours, Eric, or Jackson? Yeah, I got mine. Uh, first Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Okay. Okay. Crucified. Well, crucified uh, doesn't really solve the problem of the cross versus the pole, I guess. Well, actually, I'll let them finish, and then I want to say something after everybody's finished reading. Okay. That. All because, right. Because actually, because actually, yes, it does. But so, so go ahead. Crucified. First uh, Corinthians one eighteen uh, says, "For the word of the cross." Uh, is to those who are perishing foolishness, but the being, but who are being saved is the power of God. And then 23, but we, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block into the Gentiles' foolishness. Okay, so the verse 18 said the preaching of the cross. It doesn't say the preaching of the pole or the stake. Uh, and it, and then uh, Eric's going to say something about crucified. But do we have? Uh, uh, Mitch, do you have Philippians or? I thought I read it. Oh, what? Tanya, did you read? Whatever it was, I read it. Did Tanya read hers? I think so. Yeah, I. Oh, okay. 16, All right, so let's go to Eric's uh, exposition. Okay, the reason why I've heard this argument before, and it's not just Jehovah's Witnesses who make this argument, it's people who really aren't educated uh, about crucifixion. Um, crucifixion. <laughs> Roman crucifixion is not some obscure thing. There were other cultures that had methods of what they call quote-unquote crucifixion. Roman crucifixion is archaeological fact. It's, it's been confirmed. It was something that is actually well-known, documented. It is something their process of – they even knew how, they, how the, uh, 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 the, uh, the whips that they would use to flog people with were designed and made. The Romans took great pride in exactly how they put people on display, and that's exactly what cru Roman crucifixion was made for. It was it was a degradation of the person to be put on display, and it was do done in a very specific way. So this argument, I've never even given any credence 
if, if somebody had said some other culture or some other group entirely crucified Jesus, then I'd argue with you. But the fact that this was Roman crucifixion, which is documented in archaeology, it's a fact. It's done this way. Um, I'm not even going to give the argument any credence. Josephus describes it in great detail. You're right. Okay. All right, so we have extra-biblical accounts, uh, historical accounts of the crucifixions uh, that d debunk the pole or stake um, idea. And then we've showed scriptures that point out that uh, if you analyze the scriptures carefully, you see that uh, the sign was put above his head, not above his hands, that, uh, that there were nails in his hands, not a singular nail, and so on. So I think it's, it's uh, debunked uh, in several different ways. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not sure we should go on to another one right now because uh, it will take us too far to go on. Uh, so let's just uh, elaborate further on, on what we've covered so far. <coughs> anything ha anybody has anything to say about uh, anything that we've covered up to this point? You want to elaborate further? Dude, Maybe I better come up with another <laughs> doctrine. <laughs> uh, Tanya, uh, uh, let me redo what I said in the beginning here uh, uh, that you missed. That uh, I was making a public confession that uh, that that I am a Jehovah's Witness, and uh, I've I've had Jehovah's Witnesses come and knock on my door, and they want to tell me about being a Jehovah Witness and I'll say, well, wait a second, I am a Jehovah's Witness, but you're not. You're an apostate Jehovah's Witness. So, um, and they really are confused by that. But what, when you discuss it further, you can really explain to them, yeah, I am really a, a witness for Jehovah who is Jesus Christ, our Savior God, and you are pretending to be a witness for him, but you're, you're, you're not. So, in that respect, uh, all Christians really are Jehovah's Witnesses, but we're true witnesses because we're witnessing for Jesus Christ as being this Jehovah Savior God. Amen. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, let me let me just open it up for any any casual things that people want to say related to the the whole anything we brought up up to this point. I think I think one of the things I want to convey to people is anytime somebody comes to you with a group saying we're exclusive, you know we we uh, if you if you don't do it our way, you know you're in trouble. If you're if you're, I, I think you should always question that. Go back to the Bible and check out what it has to say for itself because all these groups we've been discussing have their foundation in Scripture and then claim that Scripture doesn't quite, you know. Fill in all the gaps. So go back to Scripture. Start with Scripture. See what it says. Then compare what these other people are processing nowadays. I mean, they're writing these books in 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 modern times. If you compare what's in there and you compare their writing, you'll see it's the writing of man. When you can, when you look at Scripture, you will see it is from God. It, it, there's it's really not that difficult. Mm -hmm. I would I would add to that that. Uh, uh, what Eric said. Also, all these groups are fear-based. Uh, they seem to be able to hold on to their numbers through fear of leaving, fear of hell. Well, when they, you leave Jehovah Witnesses, uh, then uh, you you go through the most severe of all the shunning. Uh, so they they really are the the the, the percentage of neurosis or schizophrenia in uh, the general population is so much but within the Jehovah Witness community it's like double or triple the normal it's much higher and it's because they be, they're imposed they're put in this rigid um, uh, robotic like state of rules and regulations and uh, as I said just an example could you imagine telling your your children that uh, you don't want to go to college and get a degree because the world's going to be ending soon. It's a college is a waste of time. Uh, instead, your time is better spent in just knocking on doors. Uh, when you when you grow up in a family like that, you imagine the, the, what happens to someone's uh, mental health.
Someone bring it in the groceries? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, I think some of the main things that we've covered so far is, one, you, you have them saying that the, the scriptures, the Bible, is not where you get the truth. You get it from uh, the organization, the Watchtower Society. That's, and you're incapable of understanding it. They need to explain it to you. And then the, there's this small group of people who get to go to heaven, the 144,000. And uh, then the, since that part has already been full, uh, satisfied, they've met their quota, then everybody else, the best you can hope for, is being a good Jehovah's Witness and being in this uh, uh, crowd, this large crowd of other people that get to live on earth but can't go to heaven. And, um, and then the rules and regulations that we've seen them impose for, for communion, for uh, uh, against uh, blood transfusions, and so on. You can see that this is a, uh, an organization so much like the others that say, You've got to rely on them for your truth, and you've got to follow their rules. And then, like every religion, it's all based upon your ability to perform rather than your faith in the Savior. They have a, they have a lot in common with uh, a lot of uh, Christian and non-Christian movements. Yeah. Okay, if... Uh, if um, if you don't have anything else to say, we'll close the show now, and then we can talk privately afterwards if you want to hang out a little bit. But uh, I'll give everybody a chance to say goodnight to everybody, and also any final remarks you want to say on this stay about the study tonight. And we'll start with Brother Joseph. Well, I, I enjoyed the study. I've learned a whole lot about a group that uh, I've heard a whole lot about, but uh, never really knew anything about. So uh, very enlightening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, brother, for coming. And Brother Eric. Uh, I just want to say that you know, consideration has to be given to when we have these conversations about just what we talked about, you know, the um the pressure and the consequences of trying to leave these groups uh, can be sometimes devastating financially, uh uh professionally, personally. Um and it's very difficult for a person to break away from that. So if, if you are looking into it, I think you, you need to consider for yourself, you know, what is truth? And, you know, if, if you're not involved in the truth, um, even if there's a price to be paid, you know, God's going to reward that on the other side. So don't let that fear of the unknown or fear of what you may go through for a short time uh, stop you from having a right relationship with, uh, with Jesus Christ. Jackson. I just want to say to, kind of like I did with the Mormon LDS thing, to say anyone who's thinking of leaving Jehovah's Witnesses, if maybe maybe you're having doubts about it, I would really, really encourage you to look at biblical Christianity and the Bible Jesus as an alternative rather than just dumping a supernatural belief system as a whole. <clears throat> You know, Jackson, uh, before you said that, I had that in the back of my mind as one of my closing remarks. Because <laughs> the point, when you made the point at the end of the, the Mormonism talk, uh, I thought that was a very important thing to say, and I thought it was worth repeating tonight. And that so many people, when they finally learn the truth, they get so disillusioned that they reject uh, even theism of any kind. They just become atheists and reject everything completely. And uh, so, yeah, we would all hope and pray that uh, anybody who leaves uh, Mormonism or Jehovah Witnesses or any, any other false religion, that they would not reject uh, God entirely, but seek and, and learn the truth from the Bible and learn who Jesus Christ is. He is Jehovah God Almighty. He is our Savior. And we don't have to work our way to heaven. We just simply need to trust the Savior, and he'll, he'll do the rest. He'll give us eternal life. So, Brother Mitch? Yeah, I just was thinking about the truth that sets you free. See, all this religion and trying to please God, it's a good thing to be pleasing to God, but to think that if you're not pleasing to God, I need to fear and 
God's going to punish me, or somehow or another I'm not worthy enough. But what if there was something better than that? What if there was a God that loved you unconditionally? What if, there, what if God actually died for you on purpose in spite of your sins? And it had nothing to do with how good you are. It had everything to do with how much he loved you. So that's, that's the true gospel. If you really want to look at a gospel that sets you free, think for yourself, but also pray and look for the God that's truly good. Because what was he doing there on the cross? Was he doing that so that this way you can look at him and feel bad for yourself? Or was, was he doing that to take your sins away because he loves you? And if he was giving it to you as a gift, what should your reaction be? Bitterness? Or should it be that he gave it to you because he wants to give you life? He gives it to you with a smile on his face. Mm -hmm. That's the true God. Mm -hmm. God bless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Sister Tanya. Well, I had a great time, and this is a really interesting topic. And um, I guess if if anybody's watching this who's thinking about you know leaving the church or just looking into you know other things, um, if you're scared or nervous or you know feel like you're alone or whatever, uh, please feel free to message me um, anytime. My email is galaxydreams3 at gmail.com. Um, or anybody else on the panel would love to talk to you. So, and yeah, what Mitch said, God loves you. And that is all. Yeah, uh, everybody had some really good w words there in, in your final remarks, and, and it made me think of something else that, uh, uh, I'm thinking about people who are Jehovah Witnesses and, and hopefully they'll leave it and come to Jesus. Uh, but uh, there's also another group of people who, uh, they're not Jehovah Witnesses now, but we want to just put up the, like make uh, all the red flags so that you're aware that, wait a second, don't even consider <laughs> becoming a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, they're pretty busy knocking on doors all over America, and if they knock on your door, do not let them in to talk to you. If they, if, as soon as they identify themselves as with the Watchtower Society, don't let them in your house and talk to you. Uh, don't even give them a chance to present this false message to you. Uh, so, uh, all right, I guess we've all said our, uh, our closing remarks, so uh, I just want to ask anybody now who's watching this uh, live or if you watch it as a video later, uh, if you do not have Jesus as your Savior now, I'm going to ask you just put your faith in Him. Uh, he wants to save you. Yeah, he, he wants to give you eternal life in the kingdom of God. You'll have joy and bliss, happiness forever and ever, and all that's required of you is to trust the Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. He is God, and He became a man so He could die for our sins. He proved he's God by raising himself from the dead. He showed he has power over life and death, and he does offer you life right now, life everlasting. There's no strings attached. Just put your complete faith in Jesus, and he'll give you eternal life. Uh, if you do that, please uh, make a comment, and we'd be really happy if you, if you do. Um, I wake up every day just happy and giddy because I, I just know that uh, uh, my destination is eternal life with Jesus, with the angels, with the saints, with all the panelists, and it's going to be a blast forever and ever. So I just have joy every day when I wake up. <laughs> so uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.